Welcome to the Stan Sigmund Leadership and Innovation Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Jeffrey Babb. Join me in insightful conversation with business leaders and innovators as we explore the ideas, principles, and values that have informed their success. Welcome, Paul and Mark, and thank you for being guests on this first episode. Before we get started, can you both introduce yourselves and tell us a bit about your background? Sure. Uh, I'm Paul Roth. I uh, uh, graduated from a small college in uh, Missouri. I was a business major. Uh, and one of my early jobs was to bring wireless to both Lubbock and Amarillo, Texas. I spent 34 years with the AT&T family of companies, mostly in sales and operational roles in wireless, with a few notable exceptions. Stan Sigmund gave me these opportunities, and and we often joke that working for Stan was like playing a pinball game. If you did well, you get to play again. That's a little bit about me. I retired as the president of sales and services for AT&T's wireless business and very briefly acted as the interim CEO when Stan was ill. Mark? Hey, I'm Mark Collins. I went to a small school in Western North Carolina growing up and started working for the AT&T families of companies right out of college, worked there for 32 years and had the distinct pleasure of working with Stan in his organization when he was the CEO of Singular Wireless. Um, Spent uh, a number of years in the wireless business and retired in 2017 as senior vice president uh, in the organization. Outstanding. Well, thank you for getting us started with your introductions. Since the podcast is called the Stan Sigmund Leadership and Innovation Podcast, can you please tell us more about who Stan Sigmund was And what would interest the listener about him? Sure. We'd like to start with the fact, though, that he was a a champion rodeo cowboy, uh, born and raised in Hereford, Texas. He was a graduate of West Texas A&M University. Stan was a generational leader uh, with his timeless leadership principles and values. Uh, He had a larger-than-life personality, a steely-eyed giant of a man, very few words, and and a big heart. Uh, he was also a visionary leader and CEO, uh, and that's, uh, that's why I think about Stan. He also liked to tell people he got his values from his West Texas upbringing. He got his education and his career start because of his West Texas education. So it's my synopsis who Stan is. Yeah, my, my take on that, uh, Dr. Babb, is Stan was the first CEO that I ever got to work with on a regular basis. Uh, I had met and worked with previous CEOs of the Bell South Corporation and I had great admiration and respect for those people. But Stan was the first person that I met uh, when he came to the Senior Leaders Conference at Bell South back in the uh, early 2001, 2002 timeframe, maybe it was 2003, when Stan was coming back as a, as a member of the board of Singular to become the CEO of Singular because we needed a leadership change to drive the business where it needed to go. And I remember hearing him speak and thinking, I'd really like to work for that guy. He's, he's somebody that uh, obviously knows what he needs to get done and uh, has a, a great road ahead of him. And uh, 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 roughly six months later, I was in the organization. Well, thanks for your answers, guys. Um, in reflecting on why we're talking together today, um, I'll kind of tell a little bit of story in my end. I was speaking with a research colleague not long ago, and we were debating the qualities, the dispositions, and the types of leadership, knowing that, you know, that's pretty important in our development of students. In our discussion, we concluded that there are many conceptions and perhaps misconceptions of what leadership is and why it does or perhaps does not matter, depending on your take. So I'll make that into a question. Why is leadership such an important component of innovation? and innovation's diffusion? Yeah, lead, leadership is all about people. And Stan uh, made a career best of what I can tell and what I saw and what I participated in, in betting on people. He, uh, he would give the right people and put them in the right places and then give them an opportunity to uh, what I refer to as self-actualize. You know, take the talents that they had and use them to the utmost, providing a framework that they could work within, but then um, uh, allowing them to be the best they could be. And if you think about the core tenet of leadership, 
um, or a couple of the core tenets of leadership. It's, it's those two things. It's getting the right people in the right places with the right talent and then letting them have the opportunity to do what they do best. Stan was outstanding at that. I would add that uh, most leaders, really good leaders in, in American business today, um, they provide a vision. Uh, they also provide a roadmap of how to get to their, their vision. What separates the good leaders from the extraordinary leaders was exemplified by the way Stan approached it. Stan provided a vision and then he provided guardrails. And as Mark just said, he bet on people to be the innovators. The advantage of what Stan does is it doesn't limit the innovation to what the leader's vision and abilities are. It unleashes the entire talent of the organization. That's the subtle difference, but major difference between a good leader and an extraordinary leader, in my opinion. Stan was extraordinary. There's another, there's another piece, Dr. Babb, of, uh, you know, uh, uh, Collins at Stanford, good to great, uh, built to last, Jim Collins. You know, he describes as the difference between a level four and a level five leader. The, the, there's lots of outstanding leaders at level four, but the truly world-class leaders are at level five. And Stan would have been one of those people, I'm sure, if, if uh, Dr. Collins uh, knew he was. Obviously, he's no relation to me. Um, and that the difference that he talked about, there's one trait that you can, you can take away from uh, a person that's a level five leader, and Stan was one of those people, and it's humility. Mm-hmm. Stan was humble enough to understand that it was, he was carrying, or, I'm sorry, he was riding on all of the people in the organization that were doing all the work, that was doing all the work that needed to get done. And uh, uh, he, he truly looked at the business that way and really taught me a lot about how important it is to be humble and to make sure that you're taking care of the people that are taking care of your customers. Great. Thank you. Uh, for, for my tech, go ahead. Did you have a, a, an additional? I just had a question, Sorry. Dr. Babb. Would, would it sure. be helpful to the audience to have an example of the type of innovation that that stand on lease? Is that a question to ask later or is that a point? No, I, I think I, I you, absolutely. Um, I, I think if it's on your mind, it's probably on somebody else's mind as well. Well, I, I thought, I thought of this and there were, there were a number of good examples of where Stan provided this vision and then these guardrails and let the organization innovate toward the, toward the vision. And, and one of the first ones is, is would take the audience back. Uh, Stan had a vision for a cell phone to work anywhere in the world, the same way it worked at home. That is not the way the wireless industry started. Everyone sitting in the audience holding a smartphone today should realize there were different technologies and different devices in different cities and certainly in different countries. So Stan set these guardrails for both profitability, he always thought share owners as one guardrail, and he also thought about our values and the customer experience as other guardrails. So he bet on people, as Mark said, to innovate and they delivered global standards for the devices and global interfaces that allowed phones to hand off from one network to another, even if they weren't the same company or same provider. Then he, then he, then he further uh, oversaw the innovation, if you will, that allowed us to use these devices in over 222 countries. And you could do short messaging, you could do voice, you could do video. Uh, everything that you do today when you pick up your phone, fly across the world, land and turn it on, was a result of the kind of innovation that Stan Sigma saw in the early 80s as necessary for the wireless industry to really reach its peak. He didn't tell us to go create device standards and network standards and network interfaces and billing systems that allowed you to build from Italy back to Lubbock, Texas. He just said, these things have to be able to work everywhere. One guardrail is profitability. Our share owners have to be rewarded for the investment we make to make this happen. The other guardrail will be our customers and their experience, go. I just thought that would be helpful for the audience to understand a little bit about how visions and guardrails work. And then in real world, everybody picks up their smartphone today and realizes it used to work in your home city. That was about it. Well, there's, a, there's another market uh, uh, dimension to that story too, Paul. If you remember, um, as the industry evolved from being you know, a wireless device you carry with you to talk to people to a wireless device that you use for whatever you need to do. It's, it's a, literally a computer in your pocket. Um, you know, 
then it evolved to this so-called Internet of Things where we connected all sorts of other things around the, not just around the United States, but around the globe. And, uh, you know, what our, our colleagues that were, were pursuing that, uh, that line of business uh, had a competitive advantage over the rest of the industry because based on the direction that Stan had set and the work that the people had done, uh, he created, we, or the team created what was known as the Global Sim. And it was the only one in the industry. And so if you're a car manufacturer with plants all, literally all over the globe, you know, manufacturing your products, you want that to be able to work anywhere and everywhere. And that, that team had a, at least a year, if not a 24 to 36 month head start on the market. And they garnered a ton of market share as a result of what Stan's original vision was. Right. It sounds like uh, the, uh, and I see this a lot in um, other uh, areas of technology that uh, the success of one innovation becomes the breeding ground for the entire, you know, set of follow on innovations that everybody wakes up one day and finds it's normative, but these things aren't accidental and probably not likely to come about on their own. It required that intervention and vision um, that the both of you were describing about Stan. Absolutely. Good. I um from from the question I had asked, uh, I'll just certainly put in my um, two cents is that I fall on the leadership does matter camp, and I know it matters in successful technology design, which is what you've been discussing, you know, in the development and implementation of it. Um, so I like that guardrails, um, um, you know, motivation and vision, and it sounds like there's a good equal measure of each of these and in, in the stories that you're sharing as an educator. I'm really interested in leadership development. Um, I think it's a really vital component in the, um, how we shape uh, the students to go off towards success. So I'm curious about your thoughts on this question. Um, what is the balance of nurture and nature and leadership development? And maybe put another way, can this be learned or are you just born with it? I, I, uh, I have a very strong opinion on that. So uh, just make sure that you... Uh, characterize and qualify that it is an opinion, but I, I believe that leadership's a learned behavior. Um, you you absolutely uh, learn by doing. Um, you know, experience is uh, all of your mistakes, helping you understand what not to do in the future. Um, and and I believe that Stan believed that as well, um, and that's why he would give people, you know differing levels of experience because he knew you're a human being, you're going to make mistakes. Let's put you in a place where the mistakes that you make while you learn are not as impactful to the business or impactful to other people while you're going up that learning curve. And um, that that was just a, a, an incredible, it's one of those things that's easy to say and simple to think about, but really hard to do to give people that uh, that level of responsibility and then watch them fail without, you know, yanking them out of the ditch unnecessarily. You know, Stan used to like to say, wisdom comes from experience. And uh, as Mark said, he, he was talking about lessons in life and in leadership. And, and he would often put really talented people into roles that were completely outside their comfort zone for the sole purpose of helping them grow as leaders and learn as leaders. And uh, so I agree 100% with Mark, leadership is learned. And in, I, in my personal case, I was probably 30 years into my career with a variety of roles before I actually felt like I was starting to master it. So yeah, in my opinion, leadership's 100% learned. And these experiences that you get along the way are part of it. it. Starts with your education and then it continues with your work education, if you would put it that way. Dr. Yes. Brad, let, let me qualify that though with a couple of things. I agree with everything Paul just said. I, I, I absolutely believe that leadership is a learned behavior. That said, um, leadership requires certain talents, empathy, humility, things we were talking about earlier, um, and, and there are many others. And you either have those talents or you don't. So they can, they can be brought out as a part of experiential learning to help you get better but you can't take someone who lacks empathy and turn them to an empathetic person. So not everyone is equipped to lead large organizations 
uh, to great business results. But that's okay. Not a, we, don't, we don't all have the same talents. Everybody has ro- different roles to play. And that was another thing as a leader, you know, that Stan would teach you to do is to help that person maximize what they're really good at and let them play that role. Um, because not everybody can be a Stan Sigmund. Not everybody can be a Paul Roth. You know, everybody has different roles to play. And, uh, you know, it takes a team to win the game. Uh, no individual wins any game. Well, then there would be almost, uh, um, as we would have here in higher education, um, prerequisites um, of, of a sort. And, but there are certainly things, um, perhaps even those could be worked on, um, you know, I, I would imagine. That's actually a good, um, reasonable segue into um, kind of exploring the same direction. So I'll take it back uh, to my experience in the classroom. What I typically teach is application development, computer programming, things of that nature. Um, I find there's a large degree of actually self-directedness and self-regulation required to persist toward success in this space. You know, it's not going to come easy. When I was listening to earlier, I thought of, you know, there's some type of balance between fear, experience, you know, success, perseverance. Uh, They all feel like um, phrases I would react to in listening um, to both of you, particularly describing your experiences and your experiences with um, Stan. So from my perspective, it seems that there are some habits and dispositions that could be adopted um, and certainly adapted um, that would better facilitate success. And, and you had just actually said that more. So I'll phrase that into a question, though. Um, what would Stan Sigmund say to this? Success is 10, 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. And just as a quick follow on, um, agree or disagree, but do you have any of your own perspectives on the matter? Sure. I, I, I smile at your question, Dr. Babb, because the first thing Stan would do in typical Stan fashion is he wouldn't say anything. He would smile and nod his head in agreement. And, you know, he, he liked to say that a good plan was a job half done. Uh, execution was always his focus and results matter. In fact, one of Stan-isms that we all like to quote was, the only excuse for activity is results. And, and every meeting we had with Stan ended the same way. We agreed on what needed to be done, and he'd say, execute, execute, execute. Mm. Stan was always about the work. A, a, a plan, as I said, was a job half done. The real job was go execute the plan. And uh, really, in my own perspective, when I, when I graduated from college, you know, I was told my value was not in, in what I knew, uh, with my four-year education, but it was in how hard I worked. And uh, so I, I worked everyone I knew. I mean, many people in my, uh, in my first class at at t came from more esteemed schools than my little state college. Uh, I think they were much brighter than I was. And, um, you know, and I thought about that as I entered this class, but none of them outworked me. You couldn't outwork me. I simply outworked everybody. And, uh, all I did was work long hours. I worked really hard until such time that my actual work experience became of value to the company. So early on, I think for most people, myself included, my value was in how hard I worked. And that's the perspiration question. Over time, you're valued for how much you know. Uh, ironically, uh, this all comes full circle for me. I was working for, I didn't know it at the time, I was working for one of Stan's lifetime friends. He was starting this little wireless company called Southwestern Bell Mobile Systems. And he called and said, do you have anybody who's willing to work their butt off for me on a new startup company? And my boss said, yeah, I got this one kid that just outworks everybody. Stan hired me six weeks later. I was working for him in the wireless business. So in my opinion, it's 95% perspiration. (laughs) Mark, how about you? You know, Paul, I, I, that, all of that resonates with me, and, and I have a, a personal story to share there as well. You know, Stan, one of Stan's favorite, uh, uh, what we, we all refer to as Stanisms, are six words, and, and those six words are efforts are appreciated, results are rewarded. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, sometimes you can you can get so caught up in the day-to-day business and, you know, meetings and you know, at, uh, what Paul so aptly talked about there, activities that weren't leading to results, 
And he had this fantastic way of refocusing you on, uh, hey, look, outcomes are all that matter, right? How you get there, as long as it's not illegal, immoral, or unethical, is uh, your business. But you got you to gotta get the results. And I remember, uh, so I, I, um, uh, I ran, uh, I was asked to go run the, the uh, uh, Northeastern Market region um, uh, when I came to work in Stan's organization. <clears throat> and they'd had a really tough time over the previous few years, which comes back to a, another stand uh, element we can talk about a little bit later. But that leader needed to be replaced because the results just weren't where they should be given uh, the, the brand's position in the market and what we knew could be returned based on what we were generating in other areas. And I'd been, I'd, I went uh, up in, uh, in, in November and December of that year and so I got paid my bonus based on those two months being in the market. And I got a call from my supervisor at the time who worked for Stan in February. And he, it was, this is an actual conversation. And, I, and I'm not making any of this up. And I think I still remember it verbatim. He said, Stan was generous. You got 50% on your bonus. You'll do better next year. And that was the end of the call. And, and he hung up. And, and and when he said he was generous, he meant it. I mean, the actual results were 39%. And Stan felt bad for the market. He felt like he had failed the market in giving them a leader that could lead them to the results that needed to be generated. But that, um, that conversation that I'm sure was relayed directly from Stan um, was one that was able to sharpen the focus of that market and... I was able to use that as an example anytime anybody had any questions about, well, what, what should we be focused on? It's like, well, anything that you're doing that's not going to get us better than a 50% bonus payout next year, you probably shouldn't be doing that. So let's mm -hmm. recalibrate and make sure that we know what we're doing to go drive the business the way our leaders want to get want it uh, to be driven. Was there uh, clear uh, goals and objectives? Dr. Bell, let me, let me, if I could, just, just add sure. one, one comment, because I think the, uh, the audience has probably read and heard and studied many leaders that were very results focused. Um, mm -hmm. Stan had a saying, and it was his most consistent saying, uh, our integrity is not for sale. Mm -hmm. So it was not results at all cost. It wasn't executed at all cost. And anyone that crossed that line, no matter how talented they were, no matter how justified they thought it was or how good their results were, if they did anything that Stan Fed thought crossed the line of integrity, which was always a bright, clear line with Stan. There was nothing vague about it. They were with the organization a very short time. Mm -hmm. And so this was a results-driven company that knew the integrity of the company, the integrity of the individual was not for sale. And he absolutely refused to compromise. We lost some really talented people over the years because they just didn't understand that. That's the other thing that made Stan truly an extraordinary leader. It was get results, do it the right way. Right. Paul, Paul, Paul add in on that if you don't mind the notion of the balance scorecard too. Because, you know, if you just push for one metric or one set of results, you know, you, can, you learn as a leader there are several levers you can pull but getting to the balance is a really difficult thing. Talk about that, Paul. He was a genius at that. It's Stan, Stan had this, Mark's right, Stan had this concept of a balanced scorecard that we put in place. And the whole idea was, and I'll give an example that I think will help with the audience, is that for every desired result or outcome, there's a countermeasure that needs to be looked at very carefully. A good example of that might be a real simple one. Uh, a market that had high sales, also then was balanced with what, what's your churn? What percent of your customers leave you? Was there something you did to get the sale that resulted in the customer to be unhappy, make a decision to leave the company? So sales on one end was booked in by churn, which is the percent of customers that leave over a period of time on the other. Another example would be accessory sales. If you had a, mm -hmm. a high number of accessory sales, but the countermeasure, the balanced scorecard says, what's your return rate? If customers feel like products are being pushed on them, they're going to return them because they're not happy with them. So Stan got this idea that the balanced scorecard will show us the true performance of any individual in any organization. We had it literally down to the individual level. So you could have 50,000 sales reps, 
And every sales rep had a balance scorecard. And we could look at them in this holistic way that Mark is talking about. They, they, you could take, it's the only organization I've ever been involved with at scale where everybody understood exactly what was expected of them. We called them the four R's. Uh, it was rate of penetration, revenue intensity, return on operations, and your reputation. And all four of those things were easily measurable at the market level, and we could take it all the way down to the store uh, and, and, and location level. And it was just an amazing thing to watch uh, that simplicity of that message and the importance of each of the elements of that message and how it manifested in the organization. You know, that's a, um, that's a balance. And it is, as we're moving off of the question about, you know, perspiration, inspiration, um, balance, um, although we had suggested it's uh, far tilted in the, in the one direction of uh, just action, right? Doing. But what's interesting about action and doing is that's probably where the reflection necessary to maintain that balanced uh, scorecard is possible. You know, that's a, um, a realm of kind of research thinking on how practitioners work that I'm fond of. It's just, uh, it would be called a reflective practice. The idea is that you need to be aware and the best way for that awareness is to be in the work. And that's what I hear both of you describing. You, know, you can't be uh, side cards of the work. You have to be in the work. Hey, can yeah. I elaborate on that point for you please, for a second? Please, please. Yeah, I, I wrote this down earlier as I was just thinking about, you know, things that might be helpful to that Stan taught us. You know, one of the things that he didn't expressly taught, teach us, uh, but he did it doing what I call demonstrating the desired behavior. You know, people listen to what you say, but they watch what you do. Mm -hmm. And he taught everyone that leadership is, is a participation sport. It's not a spectator sport, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, he expected you to be engaged and involved in all aspects of your business. He would, he would tell a leader, you're the eyes of the shareholder, you're the eyes of the employee, and you're the eyes of the customer in that market. And I'm expecting you to, to look at all three of those things and understand them really well and make sure that you understand what you need from me and our team to go be successful in the marketplace. Right. So the leader is uh, uh, the intersection of, of knowing um, in that regard. I mean, who knows what's going on? The person who puts themselves at that crossroads. Um, but speaking of crossroads and, and just roads in general, a nice uh, term that I've heard being used in this conversation is um, guardrails. And I'll go ahead and pivot towards uh, values and principles because um, it's been characterized that well, those aren't for sale. Um, in and along those lines with values and principles, um, I'll make this statement. It seems that AT and T was positioned to leverage innovation at multiple moments across its history, and certainly the times um, you've been involved there and with Stan um, in the stories you've been sharing in, in this discussion. So, and it very seems uh, seems very clear, rather, um, that leadership is the key driver that's been pretty well established. Um, so perhaps as guardrails, um, what has been the importance of those values and principles? And let me put it a different way. Um, are these values and principles then perhaps the really key ingredient for innovation to flourish? Um, well, I'm going to, I'm going to try to paint a visual picture as best I can. So if, if you would envision literally uh, on a, on a drawing, uh, like a road, there are, there are two parallel lines, and they are leading to a vision. Mm -hmm. So the vision's the destination. One of those guardrails, if you will, is values, and the other one are principles. And when an organization fully understands these guardrails, the boundaries, we don't, our values are our values. We don't compromise those, and our principles are just that. They, they are the way we guide our actions and our behaviors. Now we all understand what the destination is. We know where we're going. What that does for an organization is it unleashes the, the power of the entire organization to innovate toward this vision. And yet it's very clear how far you can go in the name of innovation. So it's a very focused approach. It's a very deliberate approach. And yet every individual has the ability to contribute. And that, to me, is, is the essence of what, if you will, the X factor for some of these companies companies is you, the, the values and the principles give employees boundaries mm -hmm. 
so they know where they can go and they know when they're off course. And the vision remains the destination we're all striving for. So if that visual works for people, it's a, it's a great example. And later we can talk a little bit about how that helps shape the relationship with, with Apple and the iPhone. Mm -hmm. No, that's perfect. And that's, um, that, that's why I said guardrails and it, it's a great answer. You're basically saying that's exactly it. That's what's defining the road. And, um, it lets everybody know that they are on a road. Um, I, I like that. So last year, the friends of Stan Sigmund, um, West Texas State University and the Paul and Virginia Engler College of Business developed and um, facilitated an inaugural Stan Sigmund Leadership and Innovation Series. And this was an event we held on campus with the featured guest and um, you know colleague and friend of yours, Ralph De La Vega, um, who's certainly solidly among the friends of Stan Sigmund. Now, I mention this because in preparation for that event, um, both the two of you and Ralph had developed a core set of values and principles um, that were shared with us as being reflective of Stan's approach to business and life and relationships. And that became a very concrete uh, set of items to be able to share for anybody participating in the event, uh, very particularly students. And I would certainly include in, um, you know, any type of show notes that would um, go along with this episode, the actual values and principles, but I will um, list a few of them off here because I think they're, a, they're very compelling and interesting, and they're perhaps maybe to the casual listener going to feel deceptively simple. Um, most effective things are. So I'll, I'll read them off. We have authenticity, uh, in no particular order, by the way, integrity, um, accountability, teamwork, execution, people, communication, empathy, respect, and vision. So as we move forward, not necessarily just in this episode, but as we hope to um, attract more guests in the future, who um, certainly people who would know Stan and his accomplishments, or just people who would resonate with, um, you know, these guardrails, if you will. Um, so we can actually get to, um, if you would, the story that I think many listeners would be um, have an easy time relating to about Stan. And that would be the strategic partnership, um, you know, with Apple, um, and certainly in the development of a very comprehensible key innovation, which is the iPhone. You know, I, I've characterized it here as a parad paradigmatic shift, and so to so of the both of you in daily life, business, society at large. So I'll cut to the chase of the question: What is the short version of the iPhone story, and what role did Stan Sigmund's leadership and values and principles play in the success of that deal? Well, it's, uh, it's probably the, the biggest evolution in the wireless industry, obviously in the communications and in the wireless industry operation. And uh, it's difficult to make this a short story, but here goes. Uh, if, you, if you look in the early 80s, I'm old enough to have been a part of that, Mark was too, company names like Motorola, Audiovox, Oki, EF Johnson, these were the early US cell phone makers, manufacturers. And innovation was simply making them smaller. You went from a car phone to a briefcase phone to a thing that looked like a brick. And continuing innovation was just trying to make cell phones with voice capability smaller and with longer battery life. That was innovation. BlackBerry came out with this innovative personal data assistant with this QWERTY keyboard that allowed email from a device. But it was targeted really for the business market and the operating system was completely controlled by BlackBerry and businesses couldn't modify it if they wanted to, to, to make it adapted for their own need. At the same time, wireless companies controlled the network innovation and largely, largely left device innovation to these manufacturers. But Stanley was also an engineer. In addition to a visionary, he was an engineer. And he had a vision that wireless networks, which were analog at the time, would evolve to be digital and they would be national in coverage which would mean better voice quality and a whole wave of innovative services like short messaging service, which we know today as text messaging, pictures, videos, surfing the web. Stan needed a device for the mass market that was capable of his network vision. And I was with him when we went to a few of these traditional cell manufacturers and none of them shared Stan's vision. None of them were interested in partnering, none of them were interested in developing what Stan wanted. Steve Jobs and Apple had a vision to create a better phone in every way. 
but they wanted the independents to have complete control over the hardware and the software development. Steve talked to Verizon. He talked to AT&T. Verizon would not give him the control he wanted. Stan said, I'm willing to take that chance. Now, Stan had never seen an iPhone. He'd never even seen a prototype. When he agreed to a multi-year, multi-billion dollar commitment on, he used to call it a bet the farm uh, Mm -hmm. commitment, that Apple could deliver a game-changing device. And Stan often said he didn't bet on Apple. He publicly said he didn't bet on Apple. He bet on a person. He bet on Steve Jobs. So back to Mark's earlier point, Stan bet on people. And that was one of the great leadership principles that he held dear. And I think it really exemplifies one of his most important principles. He found a person he had confidence in, he bet on him, and he gave them the authority and the accountability to deliver. So AT&T also had a closed network. We had a closed network architecture, closed IT architecture. By the way, so did Apple when you think about iTunes and the operating systems that go with the Apple products. So Stan and Steve agreed to work together to develop an interface that would allow over-the-air activations of an iPhone, software updates through iTunes, and through the AT&T network. Again, none of these things had happened, either at Apple or AT&T before. But Stan bet on people at Apple and at AT&T to do what had never been done anywhere in the world before. And it worked. So really one of Stan's greatest gifts was the ability to bet on people. And he often said that people will rise to the level of your expectations. And I love that. People rise to the level of your expectations. And that was throughout the organization. Steve Jobs, the brilliant visionary genius that he was, was no different than everybody else that would rise to Stan's level of expectation. It was just part of Stan's genius. So that's the Apple story, as short as I can make it. But as you can see from that, it really started with a vision that Stan had for devices and networks and interoperability and capabilities that no one had envisioned at the time and then a bet on people to actually deliver that vision. It's a fun oh, that, story. That, that, that it is. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating. And it's interesting because it's, a, it, you know, to hear you say it, it feels very uh, um, behind the scenes, front row seat. Um, you know, like what, what, what happened? And, and the answer is it's simple, but not. I'll give you one, one anecdote. Most people have probably never heard this, but uh, Steve, was, Steve was sick, um, quite sick near the uh, near the launch of one of the other iPhones. And uh, Stan was being honored by the Wireless Hall of Fame for his contributions to the wireless industry in general, all the things we've talked about. I asked Steve if he would come to the dinner. Steve wasn't feeling well. Um, he's pretty sick, spent a lot of time at home. But he shows up at the dinner, walks in, hugs Stan, and shakes his hand. And then he leaves. And later, I made the comment to Steve, I said, do you realize how few people Stan Sigmund hugs? And Steve's mm-hmm. response to me was, you realize how few people I missed dinner with my family for? <laughs> Tells you something about the bond that even Steve felt with Stan and Stan felt with Steve. Well, that's outstanding. It really underscores the, um, you know, bet on people um, um, principle that you had shared. Um, so, some of the reasons that we came to even be talking to each other um, here in this first um, episode of this podcast was um, you had um, the the two of you and perhaps others, but I I certainly know from speaking with the both of you had organized uh, an effort called, you know, the friends of Stan Sigmund. And when, and speaking to you at one point along the way in preparation for speaking today, um, you had um, really poignantly reminded me that this is all about paying it forward. Right. So we have this um, Stan Sigmund Leadership and Innovation Series, and it's very much focused on um, students, um, very much focused on anybody who could benefit, but certainly to celebrate, you know, um, where Stan's roots are, you know, where he came from and how that would have been shaping to his perspectives as well. So uh, elaborate, particularly um, for the benefit of students, um, you know, this concept of paying it forward. Sure, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, set Mark up to answer this because really this was this was Mark's uh, brainchild. Stan died in December of 20, and we were all shocked at that and and deeply saddened by his loss. And most of us felt it um, as if we'd lost not just a a colleague, but almost like a father figure to us, uh, somebody who was deeply connected to a large group of people. Mark and I are just a couple of them, and. 
Mark reached out and, and said, Paul, I have an idea, a way to, to honor Stan. And so this was Mark's brainchild. And so I really think it's appropriate for Mark to talk a little bit about how this came to be. Thanks, Paul. Uh, yeah, it, you, I think you really hit the nail on the head there with the father figure. And I mean that in the most honorary you know, way I can say it. You know, I lost my dad a couple of years before Stan died and it just devastated me. And uh, I was probably still reeling a little bit from that. You know, it takes a while to get over uh, the loss of a, of a loved family member. And then when I got the news about Stan, you know, he was so young, uh, you know, relative, you know, when I lost my dad, he was 90 years old, hurt like heck, but you know, anybody lives to 90, you gotta say, hey, a wife, life well lived, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but Stan got taken away from us relatively young and it just really hit me like a ton of bricks when I learned about it. And, and I felt just compelled <clears throat> to take some of the gifts that Stan had given all of us and try to do something that would both honor him and make it available to a wider audience. And so that uh, led me to just do a little research and I was just Googling him one afternoon. And then I saw this giant gift that he and his family had already made to West Texas A&M. And I thought, well, you know, there's probably nothing that we could do to outdo what Stan had already done in typical Stan fashion. I said, but it's clear that this mattered to him. And if it mattered to him, then it should matter to us. And I knew that there would be a population, at least a small population of people that would want to be involved uh, to honor his legacy and, and to uh, pay the, the leadership principles that Stan instilled in, in all of us forward. And that's where it started. Um, I knew that, uh, I knew that people would be involved or want to be involved. Paul was my first phone call. Uh, right after Paul, we called uh, the, the former retired vice chairman and Stan's COO, Ralph De La Vega. And then right, right after that, we called the, uh, the, the current COO of, uh, of AT&T, Jeff McElfresh, because we wanted to make sure that all the generations of people affected by Stan would be supportive. And literally, you know, the rest is history. It was just amazing to see it all come together, thanks to the leadership of the, uh, the, the, the school and, and the university, Dr. Babb. Um, you know, it exceeded all of our expectations because Stan meant so much to all those people. Neither Paul nor I had to make a, a, a single fundraising phone call. People were literally emailing us asking, how much do you need and what can I do? It was a really, really amazing thing to watch. Right, right. And so that's uh, that's uh, really, you could see the resonance just listening to you all um, speak even in this discussion. Um, it, it's interesting, The and I'm sure in not exactly the same way how many lives were touched. And um, you have that punctuation to really know it. And, and that's what I hear um, from both of you. Um, in describing that. Uh, yeah, I, I think hundreds of thousands of people were directly touched by Stan during, over the course of his career. But, you know, what our vision here is, is that, you know, generations of people in the future uh, will, will get the benefit of what a great leader he was and what a great man that he was. And, uh, you know, again, uh, having having the endowed professorship that, that you now occupy, as well as the scholarships for the students that uh, will live in perpetuity was the, the best way we could think of to make sure that, you know, that eternal flame of Stan's leadership burns brightly in West Texas and then, you know, throughout the country as a result. Uh, outstanding. Um, I, I appreciate it. That's for sure. And I know the university appreciates it. And we um, I'm going to pivot here towards, um, and certainly the college appreciates it, um, but our real task, I would think, would be to, um, you know, to be good stewards of the message and good stewards of the values and principles. Um, and so I kind of want to leave off on that note and certainly um, um, provide the last word because there might have been something I missed. But um, what would you want to hear more from um, or what shall we focus on more more on, I should say? in future episodes of the podcast to continue to do the good work to, you know, put this message out. 
to basically share um, the gift or at least um, the gift as best as possible that has really motivated and excited and, and brought blessings to the two of you and many others. You know, there's a, there's an old adage that still waters run deep. And, and that's absolutely true for Stan. Uh, on the surface, he seemed to be a West Texas cowboy, a, a man of few words. I watched him walk the halls of Congress uh, promoting a merger or something that we needed to discuss in cowboy boots. It just wasn't something you see every day in Washington, D.C. But the reality was he was a very deep and complex man. And his values and principles are what those that knew him refer to as these leadership lessons that Mark and I have been referencing. There are way too many to unpack these principles that you were reading off earlier in one podcast, but each one I think is worth exploring in detail. The, the legacy of Stan is more than Stan. In fact, he would be so uncomfortable if we were talking about him as, as an icon or a legacy. What he would be happy to know is that the lessons that he taught Mark and I and generations of leaders could now help shape the next generation of leaders, in particular from a, a part of the country and a school that he held very close to him and to his heart. So I'd like to see us continue to try to unpack some of those on future podcasts, go a little deeper with examples of how the audience might be able to apply those to their own lives, their own careers at some point. So that's my view. Great. Uh, Mark? I, I totally agree. I mean, they're, they're, we could have a half an hour or 45 minute conversation literally on each one of these. One that comes to mind for me is, you know, Stan with the way he ran the business and the way he inspired other people, you know, you couldn't help but realize that you needed to be inspirational yourself if you wanted to be a, a great leader. Paul, I don't know if you remember this or not, but right right after the, um, the AT&T wireless merger, uh, there were a lot of questions about whether or not that was the right move. Uh, that company had been struggling for, for quite some time. And I remember uh, one of our chief competitor at the time was Verizon Wireless. And someone asked the chief operating officer and CEO of Verizon Wireless what he thought of the merger. And he said, um, well, as I understand it, when you tie two rocks to together, they, go, they fall to the bottom faster. And Stan took that as a personal affront. And uh, he, he, he came to a kickoff meeting we had the next day. And he did something that was very uh, atypical for him. He literally... You know, um, he he gave a, a Dick Vitale, uh, um, Lou Holtz type of inspirational leadership challenge. He challenged everyone, every one of us, and said, "We're number one in this category. We're number one in that category. We're number one in this category." And if you you guys and gals don't believe it, how can you expect the people that work for you to believe it? And, you know, I could go on and on about that example, but we have literally hundreds of those kinds of examples where Stan challenged us to be the best we could be and demonstrated the desired behavior. Well, in, uh, I thank you both. I, in terms of, well, gee, can we put a podcast together? Um, I'm certainly comforted by there probably are many gems from many perspectives and many voices um, in the wings. And I'm grateful and I um, hope anybody who would benefit from these lessons would be grateful that they could be made available um, for everybody's edification and wisdom. That's more or less our time box for the day. And I certainly appreciate uh, you, Paul, and you, Mark, um, being our inaugural guests here. Thank you for joining me in this episode. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Paul Roth and Mark Collins. I found their perspectives on leadership and innovation to be very enlightening and presented us with a wonderful start to this series. Please join me in future episodes as we continue our conversations with impactful leaders in business and innovation.